you know his hair is there yeah he's got little mm. dysmorphic faces long mm. eyelashes okay distended mild distended what do you see in the legs that posture is like uh, flexion is there in the knee joint and contraction so is abnormal also. posture abnormal posture is there okay what else does he have look yeah, at this toes toes what is that called striatal toe. toe okay so why is it called striatal toe it's a sign of striatal injury so it's seen very often in patients who have basal ganglia involvement okay anything else what would we be worried about over here with this posture so probably spastic uh, spasticity or might be contracture is there and ah so hip dislocation hip dislocation could well be there okay what else you want now you want to again touch him if you want so he's gone to sleep Does he have nystagmus? Screamed. What's that? Hello. Hi. Eyes are open. How much have I walked away? Let's confirm what the parents have said. That is, Bula. अनुज 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 आया जो अनुज अनुज सो इज नॉट रियली रिस्पॉन्डिंग मे बी इज अ स्लीपी के रिस्पॉन्ड नहीं करते हैं मैं करे छे करे छे हेलो डरी गयो छे नहीं बता अनुज घरे जाऊ से अनुज घरे जाऊ से केक लाइयो केक ओके फाइन So he's not really responding now. Maybe they have overestimated his uh, social and cognitive skills, or maybe he's just sleepy. So he's very sleepy. What else do you see? Motor examination, cranial nerve examination. Can you see his eyes? Eyes they look better. Okay, that's okay. The dryness of the cornea is fine. What else? Now I'm talking neurological. Anything you want to tell me about the? What are these? So what does it mean? Those eye movements are present. Tell me, na? They are strange. What are you saying? So they are normal or abnormal? Abnormal. Why are they abnormal? You must have absent dolls eye movements normally. So let's. She's saying dolls eye movements normally should be absent. Everybody agree? They don't agree with you. You want to justify it? What do you say? Because you're right. So tell me why you're right. So in brainstem region or. No, in a normal person, are dolls eye movements present? No. See, we have discussed this no so many times. If one of us is made to lie down and turn the head, will we have dolls eye movements? No. Why so not? So I'm saying, so it's absent, no? Conscious, yeah. So if you're conscious, what happens? So what is working if you're conscious? Your eyes and head are moving together. Your ocular vestibular reflexes keep your eyes and head together. So when I go around like this, my eyes and head go together. Correct. So when will it be absent? Brainstem. No, no. no. When will the dolls eye movement be present? Sorry, not absent. Be present. Speak in the. Cerebrum region. So you think if it's a brain region, brainstem intact? Yes, they will be. present and any other in a patient who is fully conscious a fully conscious patient who has dolls eye movements present should be Branded. checked for Branded. vision vision if you are okay. blind okay. you cannot fixate if you cannot fixate your eyes will your dolls eye movement will be present the same thing happens in darkness by the way Even after we are all when you are in complete darkness and you are not fixing, 
your doll's eye movement will be there. So presence of doll's eye movements, blindness or brain gone, brain stem present. Doll's eye movements absent, normal person, newborn, I mean newborn will have present, sorry, normal person and brain stem gone. Got it? So let's, this is, this is a very simple and straightforward neurological thing, please don't get confused about it. So he is having it present. So either he is very sleepy or he is having visual problems. He is insisting is normal. Okay. What about the motor examination, the posture, what do you think of the upper limbs? Thanks. Talk, talk in the mic. So it is a flexion in the both upper limbs. So it looks like might be spasticity in the upper limb. And in lower limb also the flexion is there in the both knee region. So it might be spasticity in lower limb also. Decerebral? No, 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 no. Decerebral is different. Decorticate, no? sorry. Yeah, but decorticate postures you would say in a patient who is unconscious and all that. Or he is having a significant alteration. If he is saying that this child is right now, we will assume he is sleepy, then you don't talk about decorticate postures and stuff. So you are right, so he is obviously, he is extremely, almost contracted at the elbow. He is definitely very spastic, much more on the right side. Keep your head always in the center when you check for this. Yeah, but he is much more on the right. Yeah, so he is contracted over there too. And when I, when he cries, see what happens. Mommy, move. So his facial movements are fine. He's arching his back. That's a sign of dystonia. dystonia. So he's dystonic in the actual muscles, that is in the trunkal muscles. And he's also got probably dystonia in the limbs. So it's a spastic dystonic. dystonic. Uh, quadriplegia. Okay. Now, can you check his motor? My, my other things you want to do. Pull to sit, karo. Severe. Okay. Leave it. Leave it. Severe head leg. Okay. So you can see the severe scissor. What is this? Retrocollis. Hmm. Oh, Retrocollis means dystonia of neck muscles. Okay. <coughs> what else do you see in his muscles? Wasting. He said there is gross wasting. Wasting is there. Yeah? Cement. You think he is grossly wasted wasting. in his fat? Hmm. His muscles seem to be quite not that bad compared to his general nutrition. You see that? He's got the nice contour of the deltoid and this kind of little muscular basis is seen in which conditions? So children who are significantly dystonic, spastic, they have continuous contractions, they can have a little bit of muscle hypertrophy sometimes. And also it can be seen in continuous muscle activity syndromes like stiff person syndrome and all that. And can also be seen in lipodystrophy. Yeah, because the fat has gone, so the muscle becomes more obvious, like in this case, that may be one of the reasons. And the other condition is myotonia. So if you know what myotonia is, can you tell me? So myotonia is when there is a failure of relaxation. So you contract well, so but it takes a long time to relax. So some children will have this infantile Hercules kind of thing. He's not obviously that, but he's got prominent muscle. I mean, muscles are a little prominent. Reflexes. It's contracting. It's very difficult. No, it's contracting. Contract contract. 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 Try it. Try and 
keep as much limb, uh, wrist movement as possible. So it may be absent because he's he's Can also contracting at the same time. Could there be anything else? Why it may be absent? Suppose the jerks are really absent. Anybody? Neuropathy. Correct. So you may have an association of a white matter disease in the brain with a peripheral nerve disorder. Correct? And there are many conditions which can do that. Okay. So now you want to summarize and tell us what the possibilities are. Actually, we already told you about the possibility. Anything else? Differential diagnosis. Do you think it's cerebral palsy? No. Why not? There is regression of the milestones. Um, but you don't think the amount of contractures are enough to explain his, uh, you know, he can't sit. But Maybe he can't sit because of this. But sir, cognitive wise. We in his parents told no ki um, he's uh, be beforehand he's uh, waving bye bye but now he's not doing it all that too slow. It's very few features, but it's possible that the because he's got significant malnutrition, significant musculoskeletal changes. It's always possible that, but this this seems to be much more. ये पहले ऐसा नहीं था ना पहले ऐसा हाथ करता था. So I think you're probably right. It is a worsening problem because the spasticity in the upper limb seems to be, you know, this kind of spasticity. There's no way he could have uh, reached out and picked out things and all that. So this must have been there recently. Before it must not have been there. Now it's come. But up. in case of cerebral palsy, it may, it will be static. It will not progress to this much of spasticity. No, no, no. Progression. What I'm saying, progression is progression. So in the in clinically, it might progress. So the process may be static. Okay. And the reason why it may clinically progress is because of musculoskeletal mm -hmm. changes. But I think in this case it's probably the other way. What's the head size? Uh, 44 centimeters. 40? 44. 44 centimeters. Okay. Which is obviously less for his age, right? In the child's notes, what would have helped you in this deciding the significance of this head size? So it is antenatal origin or not? That insert has happened up from my no, no, no. From the notes, what do you look for? Has somebody taken the head size in the past? Okay. That will answer a lot of questions. Suppose this fellow was uh, 44 at the age of one. And he's oh, maybe 43, and now he's 44. Obviously, the problem has progressed. But if he was always, you know, microcephalic, then maybe it's not really a progressive disorder. So the head circumference is very important, especially a serial head circumference, which is plotted, you know. Mm. But over here, obviously, we don't have these details, right? Hello, hello, hello. Anuj. 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 He doesn't seem to be responding. Anything else you must I think that just clarifying what sir just said a little earlier, see we have definite history that he was going for objects, etc. So what sir said is that just now there's so much spasticity. This means he has developed this spasticity later. So in a CP, whatever spasticity was there from the beginning, the spasticity doesn't, 5 units of spasticity doesn't become 10 units. But because of the 5 units, you may develop a contracture and not be able to do something later. But there's definite history that he went for objects and just now the hand is like this. So spasticity has come later, so progress. Spasticity... It's difficult to be sure how to this progress because what is spasticity? What does spasticity do in the long term? Can anybody tell me? It shortens the muscle. Okay? So the consequences of shortening of the muscle are contracture, 
the contracture leads to deformity and the shortening of the muscle also leads to limb shortening. That's why you have children who have hemiplegic cerebral palsies who over the years they have a shorter limb on one side which then goes into more and more equinus. You understand? So the it looks like there is progressive spasticity because of this musculoskeletal changes which occur. Now in this situation there are significant problems in his lower limbs. He is almost dislocated, you know, his hips and it looks terrible this kind of... So I don't know whether... He, I mean, there is no way you can sit with this kind of hip dislocation or with this kind of... Uh, but I think probably, just from guessing it, that he was putting his hands forward and all, that's why I think probably it has really progressed. Also I am not sure about his social and language. Uh, Could it have been only because of contractures and no progression? I don't know. It may be, but I think it's probably not that. I think it's probably progressed. Okay. So what is cerebral palsy? So we all agree that it's probably not cerebral palsy. Correct? Same people are answering. Two people. Behind Kutsto Bolo here. You want to say anything else? So, uh, in both, uh, there is history of convulsions also started at, uh, 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 history of uh, seizures uh, started at age of 15 months. Uh, you have uh, generalized tonic-clonic movement of both upper limb and lower limb with uprolling of eyeballs and frothing at mouth and uh, there was a left eye twitching movement also associated with blood bubble incontinence. So basically is that seizures very often or very few? It's uh, very often. Okay. And, and uh, even uh, now... So that goes against the first thing we thought of. Perizia's Masbaka because we didn't really give her a chance to finish the history. And she didn't tell us about the seizure but obviously the seizures are a major thing and that might also explain why he's lost his eye contact and all that. Uh, I mean, uh, seizures are uh, even uh, present now, I meaning it is very frequent. Uh, every day? Yeah, every day. It's no fit both at the end. Roja, I wish. Fit like it was the average. Yeah, I could have told you. 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 So he's having status epilepticus and several attacks a day. Okay. So let's just, uh, you want to finish the case and then go on to discussion. Then we'll lie down, Now, fit the carriage are you there? Where? Uh, Any question? Yeah. Uh, so, one, what are the final things you've got? Mm. Congenital nystagmus, which disappeared. Correct? Two, early developmental delay noticed at three months. Three? Seizures. No, no, no. <coughs> Relatively better social language. Motor, they don't have any black pen. If you have chalk, you can do it otherwise. So, nystagmus. Uh, 
GDD more motor regression over years severe seizures more since the last one year with status spastic dystonic sir yeah abhi wal ko bas to aisa mat kare pure din raat mein isme ho gaye quad with deformities right then anything else failure to thrive feeling issues uh on the background of consanguinity and normal birth history so birth history uh, uh, there was a history of fever or uh, antenatal theek hai theek hai so don't let's complicate the story you know <laughs> you are bringing out these little bit you know slowly thoda thoda bada rahi hai acha theek hai so normal or minimally abnormal birth history so first thing is is it cerebral palsy So, what is the points against cerebral palsy? Nystagmus, very unlikely. Nystagmus starting at birth is very unlikely in a patient who's had, you know, a cerebral palsy. Regression is very much against. Seizures, common. Why? Correct. So, uh, what is the? How common are they? Eight percent. No, no, no. Little more than eight percent, ten percent, like that. Yeah. So, which are the ones who have maximum seizures? Which types of cerebral palsy? Quadriplegics and hemiplegics. Fifty percent, maybe more. So, seizures not a problem. I forgot to write one more thing. he saying social language better but we are doubting that this is a very important part eh? never just accept history is just on the face value you have to make sure sometimes parents you know see things which are not there so maybe that is also a problem spastic dystonic quadriplegic cp no problem at all deformities no problem at all failure to thrive no problem at all feeding issues no problem at all consanguinity always a red flag so when you have a combination of normal birth history and consanguinity think something else okay now what it is you require for the investigation that we will have to i don't want to go you have any uh, mri is mm. you think we can see or see? no the mri no please okay so we don't have to so leave it what is the report uh, there was one report which was normal uh, speak in the mic please uh, there was one report which was uh, normal when uh, at 4 years of age huh? Four years of age. Four years of age, and uh, then then one more uh, just provisional report uh, which suggestive of uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to see the MRI, let's say, because you know hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy didn't come on the second <laughs> MRI. First one was not there, so it doesn't make sense. What is your comment on a normal MRI in cerebral palsy? Hmm. It was against too uh, strong. Yeah. So if you look at data. 80 to 85 percent of cerebral palsies have abnormal MRIs. And what are the patterns of MRIs? 
So certain patterns of an MRIs are very common. Let's take the four most common thing which you have. I'm not using this, it's very difficult to write. Say perinatal asphyxia or birth asphyxia or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy which then leads to injury. Where is it? What type of what are the types? Central and peripheral. Central and peripheral. What is central, Sodari? Where is the injury in central? Basal ganglia. A little bit in the cortex, but mainly basal ganglia. And what is the peripheral? So what do you get in the CP? Quadriplegia, dystonia and spasticity. So it's exactly like this. Okay. What about peripheral HIE? Ah, what about the cognition and social in, in central HIE? Better or worse? Be Better. Better. So you have a lot of motor. You have also, they also can't speak and all that. But they are better socially. Second is peripheral is what? So it was perirolandic. Uh, no, peripheral is the cortex. Cortical. The cortex goes. So you get spastic quadriplegic with severe retardation, retardation. and severe seizures. Like this? Possible. But the brain MRI cannot be normal. Let's go to the next one. Uh, prematurity, spastic diplegia is? Periventricular leukomalacia. Okay, and that usually means where is the main problem? In the white matter, where? Germinal nitrogen. Close to the ventricles. Okay, posteriorly more than anteriorly. Therefore, the deficits which you have are legs more than arms and vision. Also, can have seizures, but much less. Third is connectress. Where is the damage? Where? Global spellidus and therefore dystonia is very common and socially they may be quite good. Okay, it also affects brainstem nuclei. So, where, where what are the findings in connectus besides uh, dystonia? There's dystonia. So, dystonia means uh, uh, hypertonia which increases on action usually and has twisting postures, right? So, hyper uh, officitonus is when you have dystonia in the trunk muscles. Retrocolus is when you have dystonia in the neck muscles. You have hand muscles, they go back like this. Leg muscles, you know, same things. So all these are dystonic postures which increase on any sort of action. So, besides the dystonia and quadriplegia which you get in uh, connectus, no hearing loss. Okay. So, hearing loss. And one more, gaze pulses. Gaze pulses. They can't look up. That is because of brainstem involvement. Hmm? And the last thing is stroke. Okay? So an acute stroke. What do you get in that? Yeah, so where is the stroke usually? Middle cerebral artery. When does it occur? When usually? Antenatal. 70% before birth. When is it noticed? Yeah, after six months. Because when you start using your hands, before that you don't realize you may have a hemiparesis. So early handedness is what suggests. It. And the MRI you will find a stroke on one side. Socially and cognitively in language? Often normal. Main morbidity? Seizures. The comorbidity. I think uh, anything else you want to discuss? Fantastic. No, no. Anything else on CP? How do you manage? Management of CP. Sorry? <laughs> so what are your goals? So first thing is establish goals. Okay? So goal for a quadriplegic child is what? No, no, forget about this child. This is a very complicated thing. 
This is not CP first of all, so we really can't comment on it. But generally speaking, your goals were different for a hemiplegic, your goals were different for a diaplegic, your goals were different for a quadriplegic. So what are the goals for a quadriplegic? With a quadriplegic, sit and stand and walk or no? A quadriplegic means equal involvement of the arms and the legs. There's another thing which is very rare called double hemiplegic. What is double hemiplegic? Upper is worse than lower limbs. So, basically the worst are the quadriplegics and double hemiplegics. And their thing is to make him sit first. And maybe points against which will come in against sitting at deformities. Most important hip dislocation. Other problems are feeding issues. Feeding issues, hip dislocation, malnutrition, seizures. So the goals are to make him as functional as possible. But the parent should understand that if he doesn't sit by two, which is extremely unlikely, if his hands don't work, how can you sit? But that's what we tell them. It's unlikely you're going to walk. So it gives you a sort of, at least two years they will do good therapy. Okay, so they have to be managed, for example, uh, physiotherapy to prevent contractures. Feeding, you may put a tube here or you may put a tube here. This is the ideal candidate for that. Mm. For nutrition, vitamin specific, everything can be given. Drugs. For spasticity, can you give drugs? Most of them are ineffective. So you can use baclofen, you can use very high doses. Usually at his age, at his weight probably about 20, 30, maybe even 40 milligrams. In uh, older patient up to 80, 90 milligrams. Then Sir. you use medicines for dystonia. In this case is not severe. So you said tube here, which means a gastrostomy. Correct. Because that was received with great skepticism when we suggested it some time back because we had a malnourished cerebral palsy. Why is it not done so often in our country, sir? No, I think it's a... Well, there are many reasons. The most... Uh, in my practice, what I've realized is that people... Uh, feeding is a very important metabolic activity. And uh, once you put a tube in, and the parents are a little difficult to accept that uh, this is going to be a, you know, no feeling after this. So that's, I think, the main thing. Then, of course, surgery and cost and all those things. But, you know, if you do a gastrostomy, it's best to do a plication gastrostomy. So you, even the aspiration, you know, the regurgitation and aspiration, all those risks go away. Hemiplegics, how when do you, how are the goals for hemiplegics and spastic diaplegics? Ambulation. Okay, hemiplegics will automatically ambulate. So in them, you want to improve the gait as far as possible. So where is the problem in hemiplegics? Which muscles? Mainly. In the leg, it's the gastrosoleus. So they are toe walkers. They don't have much of adductors and not much of hamstrings. So really, for them, things like Botox, if possible, surgery, etc., to keep the foot plantigrade, flat. That will be the most important. So before you go to Botox and all, you've got to use physiotherapy and splints. Splints like an ankle foot orthosis. Very, very important which should be used at least 6 hours a day, often in the night, to keep it foot like 90 degrees, so you keep that uh, muscle stretched. Then you have, after 1.5, 2 years, 2.5 years, you may use Botox. You know how Botox works? Anybody can tell me? No, Botox induces paralysis. 
Okay, it's a presynaptic block. So you basically block the acetylcholine from coming out, and you cause that it's basically irreversible. And it's the most potent toxin known to man. So if you give enough, you'll kill the person for sure. So that you basically inject it in the tight muscles. You make them weaker. And remember, every joint has one muscle antagonist and one antagonist. So in the lower limb, for example, you have the gastroxoleus, which is like this. And what brings it up? Dorsiflexion, tibialis, anterior. So the balance to maintain. Now in, in spasticity, the gastroxoleus is tighter, spastic, more spastic than the tibialis anterior. So you have this phenomena, and one is strong and tight, the other one is weak and uh, therefore you weaken the tighter muscle and then try to restore balance. Unfortunately it works for only few months, three months, six months. We use plasters to prolong the effect so that you can give it twice a year. And after some time, say we have five, seven, eight, nine years, you cannot keep giving it, then you go in for surgery. And there are many new things now which are being done. But essentially, it is to prevent the foot from being from, from toe walking in the hemiplegic. Same things apply to diaplegics. There is toe walking, there is a crouch gait, there are many things. So same thing applies. In di diaplegics and hemiplegics, you must go all out to improve gait, quality of gait, and improve their function as much as possible. Okay. Good evening everyone. My patient Arman, a 5 year old right handed boy, second by birth order, born out of non consanguineous marriage, Khan by community, Muslim by religion, resident of Kurla, hailing from Balrampur, UP, was brought by mother, informing me the mother herself with complaints of progressive weakness of bilateral lower and upper limbs for last 10 days, inability to close right eye and deviation of angle of mouth to the left for last 8 days. The child was apparently all right two weeks back when he developed fever which was high grade intermittent in nature associated with significant malaise, malaise with intensity of fever being more towards the later part of the day. It was not associated with chills or rigors, any rash or bleeding from any, uh, any site and the child was active during interfebrile period. Soon after the onset of fever, the child developed cough and cold which was dry, non-productive, non-spasmodic, not associated with any postessive vomiting and cold in form of rhinorrhea. The mother also gives history of headache which was moderate to severe in intensity, frontal in location, episodic in nature, character could not be described. A little slow. Character could not be described uh, with history of, no history of any precipitating factors or any diurnal variation and it was relieved on massaging and oral medications according to the mother. The febrile illness was also associated with 2-3 episodes of vomiting which was non-projectile, non-bilious and con contents were ingested food particles. 3-4 to four days after the onset of illness, the fever subsided and the child developed pain in the bilateral buttocks and legs which was cramp-like in nature, moderate to severe in intensity Later, one, one to two days later, the child was noticed to have difficulty in standing and walking. He was observed to waddle while walking and swaying when tried to maintain posture while standing. The child was able to get up from the bed at this point of the time and was not uh, and had no problems in getting into his slippers. The child was then taken to a private hospital where he was admitted and started on some IV medications. The weakness. The weakness remained static for around one to two days when it progressed with the mother noticing child was not able to get up from the bed. It was followed by the mother noticing inability to maintain grip over objects when trying to hold them. When inquired, the child was unable to dress and undress himself as well. On the next morning, the child was then noticed to be unable to close his right eyelid and there was a deviation of angle of mouth towards left when he attempted to speak or smile. The child then 
uh, child was then subjected to a series of investigation and transferred to Sion Hospital. At the time of admission, the weakness had progressed further with child not being able to lift his limbs above the bed uh, but could move his uh, limbs sideways along the bed. The child was admitted and started on IV medications and according to the mother, the weakness did not progress any further and remained static for next 5 to 6 days after which the improvement was there was improvement noticed in form of child being able to lift his leg above the level of the bed first notice in the left limb left lower limb and upper limbs followed by the right lower and upper limbs the mother has not noticed any change in the facial weakness a uh, weakness since admission uh, there is no there is no history suggestive of any other cranial nerve involvement there is no history of uh, can you tell me any specific ones you asked for uh, for the cranial nerve involvement so I will I'll ask for uh, pulling of secretions nasal regurgitation uh, any nasal twang in the voice um, diplopia uh, diplopia dysphagia dysarthria uh, so, but which ones are you most interested in Cho choking uh, swallowing problems swallowing problems anything else shortness of breath and uh, uh, difficulty any difficulty so how does shortness of breath usually manifest the child uh, cannot complete a sentence in one breath uh, in, in, in that much time when uh, I mean in, uh, anything else mm, volume volume of voice uh, sir, uh, there might be a so there is dysphonia, dysphonia or aphonia not aphonia but a reduction in the volume that very often is because of respiratory muscle ok yes, sir. Um, there is no history of altered sensorium lethargy change in uh, uh, any history of conversions change in behavior or, or speech any time during the course of the illness there is no history of flushing, increased or absence of sweating, syncopal attacks, bowel or bladder incontinence. But the mother gives history of constipation. See, when you ask for these kind of questions, you know, it, syncopal attacks, you said no, there is no change in consciousness. No, sir. No. Fine, so just say it. No, don't ask specific questions of that. Okay. Um, the mother gives history of constipation since the onset of weakness in the form of child passing hard stools once in every 3-4 days. And there is no history of urinary retention or hesitancy. Um, there is no history of any uh, varial illness in the recent past, uh, any similar illness in the, f uh, in the past or in the family, intake of tinned food, uh, throat pain, dysphagia, neck swelling, drug intake or IM injections or any trauma in the recent past. Okay. Somebody else wants to analyze this? What about you, that side? You heard the story or you went to sleep? Huh? Please tell us. Just before she analyzes, you tell us a summary. Bef whenever you present to an examiner, there is so many details, you know. Unless the examiner also is paying full attention, he sort of misses out what you say. So at the end of your history, tell us the key salient points. Um, so uh, this five-year-old boy uh, presented with uh, acute onset of uh, generalized weakness starting first... No, 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 no. You didn't present with acute generalized weakness. Uh, Acute onset of weakness in the bilateral lower This limb. child initially had a febrile illness which you have forgotten completely about and which had symptoms of headache and vomiting, correct? Yes, sir. And then he develops pains. Pains, mm -hmm. right? He had leg pains and back pains or buttock pains buttock or something, pains. followed by an ascending type of weakness, weakness, which affected which muscles? 
first noticed in the proximal muscles. Yeah, because you said he could get into his chapels. You know, I was listening. Nobody else was, but I was. So you said there was proximal muscle weakness, which did not go down dramatically. Correct. Mm-hmm. Over a few days, it sort of went up to the upper limbs. Yes, and and anything else? The upper limb first noticed in the distal muscles. Fair enough. Then uh, and then uh, noticed as a facial right-sided facial weakness. So basically, that comes the first. There's a suddenly a unilateral problem, a right facial weakness, followed by improvement. In, followed by. Uh, the After treatment or whatever, uh, improvement. Remain static for five to six days. Yeah, so improvement. Mm-hmm. Correct? Now you can analyze it? Yes, sir. So initially, the patient started having fever followed by. No, no, don't repeat the whole thing. Now tell us what you think. Sir, uh, it is a uh, uh, acute flaccid paralysis uh, kind of thing. Uh, most uh, Mostly, it's a GBS. Uh, kind of a picture which is ascending kind of paralysis is there. So what are the points which makes you think it is GBS? Give me your pros <coughs> and give me your cons. Uh, so first of all there is a preceding uh, fever is there in the history. Uh, so there is an illness, illness which is preceding, fine. Uh, followed by sir there is uh, a pain uh, which is followed by weakness. No, no, important thing is the fever subsided. Subsided, yes. So three to four days there was no fever. The fever subsided. No, three to four days. One day. Four right? days. Fever. Three, four. three to four days. Three to four days there was fever. Then it subsided. The next day they found the weakness. Correct. Mm. Uh, sir, one to two days later. Okay, sorry, I can miss that. Then. Uh, so then there was followed uh, that fever that subsided, followed by pain, which was then after two days. Followed Everything is cause of the pain. So. Um, Irritation of the nerves or something because... Which nerves? Why do you get pain? Affection of what part of the peripheral nervous system? Many or is it not from the peripheral nervous system but something else? So, meninges or like... No. Roots, 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 roots. The very old saying in... in uh, Anterior horn cells waste, nerve roots pain, or nerve roots, roots pain, nerves tingle, and muscles become weak. Okay? So, they very clearly tell you what are the most important symptoms and signs in these four parts of the peripheral nervous system. So, very good. So, that is. Pain is probably roots then? So then which was followed by weakness. Uh, ascending ascending weakness. weakness. Okay. Um, so so that is the reason why I said most likely like GPS. What are the cons now? So unilateral like facial palsy maybe. Okay. Uh, so what are the most common cranial nerves affected in GBS? Seventh nerve is the most commonly affected nerve. Which is usually? Bilateral. 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 So that's a little bit of a con, not much, but a little bit. And the so weakness or distal is uh, more than uh, proximal, she said. Sorry? A weakness, upper. So what is the pattern of weakness in GBS? So distal is uh, more than the proximal, uh, sorry, uh, lower limb is more than upper limb. That weakness. is there, no? This. No, it's not working. Just tap it and see, no? It's glove stock like means distal. Glove stocking, no, that's for 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 sensory. Uh, so Proximal is usually first because the primary pathology in a GBS starts where? In the roots. It's not really a neuropathy only, it's a radicular neuropathy. And why do you get uh, you get pain, which is very, very common? And what it is a root cause in investigations? What does it lead to? 
because the roots are involved, that's why. What are the changes in the CSF? Protein, albumin cycle. Proteins are high. Inflammation of the of the uh, nerves. Roots. Roots. So why should inflammation of the nerve roots cause increase in protein? <laughs> what surrounds the root? CSF. There's a sleeve of CSF which comes out, the root comes out and is covered by a small motor of CSF. If that area is inflamed, the protein will go up. Correct? That's one of the theories why proteins go up in GBS, because the roots. And that's why very often it is either equal involvement or proximal involvement. Usually in our experience is the proximal is first involved in the lower limb, but also... And the, fa and the faster, of course, more likely to be proximal more than distal. The slower, of course, more likely distal more than proximal. But that's a kind of a, not a hundred percent thing. Any other differential diagnosis anybody wants to give me? No, this is the only thing. Spurti, you are an expert on this. Tell us. So, what are the other causes of which you think are possible in this history? Oh, Sonali, you tell us, you tell us. So, Spurti has finished her MD. Could be uh, following any other like non polio viruses? Okay. Then Pros and cons. Dictate. Pros and cons. So it wouldn't be symmetrical, usually. Okay, so usually, so you think you're giving the cons first. Any pros at all? The yes. interval between the febrile illness and, and the short. thing is too short. You mean against for GBS? Yeah. Not necessarily. So what are the points? Say for a, you know, a classic enteroviral disease. Now we've forgotten polio. But what are the things which are for in this history? Uh, see, there was fever and a short high period fever, of high grade fever. Headache? Headache. Vomiting. vomiting. Why do you get headache and vomiting in enterovirus? Uh, so there is evidence of an aseptic meningitis. meningitis. Correct? Two? Uh, one to two days only. Uh, no, no. Fever was four days, no? No, no, no. The gap between the cancer and onset gap of the Gap and onset You can. It's, so that is an important thing that in enterovirus, the weakness is usually very the early first, and maximal in the first one or two days. And then it remains more as the same. It does not usually progress over 8-10 days, though it can, but usually it comes and it remains that way. So in the past, you see, fever ayah, one leg would go, and then that leg would go and remain gone, and then improve over many months, or maybe not fully improve. That was the story. So the deficit is not a kind of a lumbering on deficit over 8-10 days, usually. But things can happen. It's not like it's a written in stone kind of thing. Anything else? Mm. Pros. Unilateral. Facial. How many of you send the AFP for a Bell's palsy? All of you do very good. Yeah? Because polio virus can come only as facial palsy. Okay, so that's a pro. Long back isolated facial was pro uh, unless proved otherwise polio. Okay. Long back. Yeah. And what are the cons? Uh, so symmetrical onset, uh, matlab symmetrical weakness. Okay. Ascending to. It <laughs> like can I be said, there. it's a little unusual, but it can happen. Mm. Pains is a pro or a con? Pain is it's a con. Pain is a con. So you think pains don't occur? Pains are severe in polio and enterovirus. 
polio, of course, was classic, and they used to have all those tripod sign and spasm and leg spasm, and they would be screaming away and they couldn't sleep because of that. But even in the other enteroviruses, because why do they have pain? Muscle inflammation. No, no, nothing to do with muscle. Anti- myositis. No, no, no. Polio is not myositis. Come on, we have discussed this. Anti- 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 involves root. root. I've told you root pain. And if you think polio is only anterior honsel, have another thing coming. It's meningeal, it's myelo, and it's radiculopathy. If you do an MRI, We've done recently in many couple of patients. In a patient with enterovirus, there will be enhancement of the roots. So don't forget that it's all very much part of a differential. And there was a very nice study from Ames which showed that many patients of non-polio do not have much of fever, have no cells in the CSF, and have a, a, a non-polio on the stools. So it can resemble GBS a lot. Except for bladder. Bladder is usually very often involved in... No! In, non, in uh, enterovirus. And persistent bladder is almost unknown in GBS. So what are the exclusionary... Uh, what excludes GBS from your history and examination? Persistent bladder? A unilateral facial nerve Persistent asymmetry makes it very unlikely. One-sided facial nerve involvement. Severe sensory level. Sensory level rules it out. So there are certain clinical things which you must, you know, which tell you. What about autonomic nervous system involvement? Yes, involved. very important. Autonomic nervous system we didn't talk about, but that would be in the, usually it comes with not so much from the history, because she was saying syncope and sweating. <laughs> Most of us, you know, parents are not going to observe all that. But when you, when you manage the child, you realize all this is going on. Constipation, that kind of stuff. Any other difference? Acute flaccid paralysis. So I'm just going through the differential, then we'll examine. The examination doesn't really help us. We know it's GBS. We'll probably just confirm it's GBS. But the important thing is, what are the things which go through your head? So these two are top number. One more one, GBS, 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 enteroviral. So for diagnosis is enteroviral. But there's still a differential. post so myelitis, don't say NMO, acute transverse myelitis can sometimes give you back pain, can give acute flaccid paralysis, but obviously what, what is the points against? A level is something you get on the examination, absence of bladder, absence of back pain, but you know it's all possible that this could be, even that's a post infectious illness and remember you know so that is always in the whenever you're thinking about it you must always make sure because that's a completely different treatment and different investigations then the rest are very unusual all the others you know your myasthenic crisis and all those snake bite and the hajar things for AFP okay just to ask you, what does myasthenia usually present with? Myasthenic crisis? What should be always there? Ptosis. So, ophthalmoplegia, ptosis, swallowing difficulty. So, cranial muscles are much more involved. What about myositis? You heard of childhood viral myositis? Oh. No, they see the pain. They only have pain, so that can never be considered. Extreme pain. Extreme pain, pain. no, nothing else. And calf pain, that too, not in the buttocks. So, myositis is very unlikely. Viral myositis. Yeah, yeah. It's called benign childhood myositis. Comes with flu, and then you get severe pain in the calf, then you stop walking, 
But it's not because of pain and because of weakness that he stopped walking. Because of pain. I think that means here. In general, dermatomyositis, there would be weakness as well. Yes, but that's a subacute illness. It doesn't come like this. So that but is that the it presents as weakness, but gradual. Now, what is the muscle disease which can present like this? Yes, I must. Rhabdomyolysis. So you have sudden acute breakdown. And that can occur in certain viral infections. Porphyria is more of a peripheral nerve. There are lots of other things which come, pain and all that. But generally, muscle disease which can come like this is acute rhabdomyolysis. Periodic paralysis. I mean, other thing is periodic paralysis. Hypokalemia. We had a patient over here, very unusual with a neck drop. So, this child with rhabdomyolysis would have uh, uh, myoglobin urea also? Yes. Yeah, so, that would be one of the presenting features, Correct. dark colored. But urea. that requires a lot of, uh, you know, sometimes, usually that comes from the on direct questioning. Absolutely. So, and usually rhabdomyolysis in, in children is unusual, but can, you know, it can occur with viral infections and can occur with uh, uh, sub certain drugs and that kind of thing, and of course metabolic diseases. So very unusual, but that's something which you always keep in mind. Hello. Hello. Your name is? Arman. Arman, where are you? Arman. Where are you? Your brother is what? Brother. One man is. Okay, tell us what you found. Yeah, I Show us your finding. Or oh, somebody else wants to show us? What about you, ma'am? Come, come, come. Oh, you've already done a case. The lady in the pink. So, what do you think of his posture? Yeah. So don't cover the... Uh, he is uh, unable to sit by himself. How did you come to that conclusion? Mm, like mother is supporting from Support behind. Support mother. Now he is sitting? Yeah. No, you should say whether he is getting to sit. He is conscious that, <laughs> that he will fall. <laughs> no, no, just give a neuromuscular and cranial nerve exam. Cranial nerve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First, show me the eye movements. I'll demonstrate. Do whatever you have to. You should have to come to the way now. Arman, ye isko dekho, pen ko dekho. Ye pen ko dekho. मैं पकड़ता हूँ सिर मत हिलाओ अपना सिर पेन को देखो इसको देखो 
You may be better to keep it like this. So tell us what you are testing. Go on, go on, finish. Jaldi what are you doing? So what are you testing? What type of eye movement? Um, what type of eye movement? Deviation of eyes and Anybody? conjugate eye movement. Pursuit. Okay? Pursuit mm-hmm. eye movement. She's she's following Yeah, yeah, Deko, yeah, Deko. So she's showing something. What other movements are you going to test for? Mm-hmm. Let me tell you, let me show you. Upper deck. Upper jaldi deck. Niche deck. Left side deck. Over to deck. What is that? What are those movements? Conjugate to hey na? How can you test disconjugate? My eye movements necessarily have to be conjugate. There is no way you can test eye movements disconjugate. How are you going to test? Except for one. And that is. So convergence. That's the only disconjugate eye movement you can test. Otherwise, all movements are conjugate. So what was this movement? Yadik. Upadik. Yadik. Yadik. What is this? Come on. Sakadic eye movements. So what are sakadic eye movements or what are pursuit eye movements? Anybody can tell her? It's not important in this case, but I'm just trying to tell you. Come on, tell us. No, no, no. We know how to do it. What is the difference between saccadic movements and pursuit eye movements? What is the purpose of saccadic eye movements? They have to be rapid and they have to get the object of interest to the fovea. What is the fovea? Fovea is the place, I mean the, is the macula where your, everything is the clearest. And around that is the retina, all those where everything is a little unclear. So I can see you clearly, Dr. Amdekar, I can see, but I cannot see his face clearly. Right? So that's foveal. So if he calls me suddenly, I look at him. That's a character. So to get the object of interest to your fovea is the purpose of saccadic eye movements. What is the purpose of pursuit eye movements? Sorry? So keep the object of interest on the fovea. Okay, then there are other movements. There are reflex movements, ocular vestibular reflex. So these movements try to keep your neck and everything in the same line. Neck, eye movements around that. But so basically you should know saccadic and pursuit. Now, what is gaze? As opposed to what is the what is supranuclear gaze? Can you tell me? There is an area in the cerebrum which is controlling the eye movements, and uh, it is no. So infranuclear and nuclear eye movements are basically where you have palsies. So you may have a sixth nerve palsy, or you may have a you know third nerve palsy, and all those things. It's all nuclear, infranuclear, supranuclear control. As you said, is from the uh, frontal eye field. In the frontal eye field, which controls saccadic movements to the opposite side, and parietal. The parietal, parietal is for pursuit. Huh. So the posterior eyes, forget where they are, but they control the pursuit eye movement, and then they project to the, to the brainstem or the midbrain and control the nuclear infranuclear movements, which is of course. If any problem occurs in the nerve, on the cranial nerve nucleus or whatever it is, you get a weakness in that particular muscle. In GBS, obviously you are not really interested in gaze, but I think you should know this. Okay. Next, uh, third, fourth, sixth cranial nerve. No, show me the seventh. Third, fourth, sixth, it's done. How much do you have to do it? 
You must also remember mm. one thing. When you're checking for gaze, mm. when you're check, checking for eye movements, you should always look at primary gaze. A primary gaze means when he's looking straight at you. If there is a weakness on one side, say for example the lateral rectus is weak on the right, in primary gaze, the right eye will move inwards. Okay, that's very important. So you always do it like this. First you look straight, see if the eyes are perfectly in, uh, aligned. Look for the ptosis, very important. One of the signs of ptosis is what? Eyebrow goes up. The eyebrow is used to lift up the eye. And that's only like this. This kid may be having process. You understand? And then of course you are looking at the eye movements, which you said is okay. What about facial? facial I'll ask him to close his, uh, eye no, no, do it, no. Aak, aak ek dam tight se band karo. Jor se. Jor se band kar, jor se band kar, jor se band kar. And this is what you do. You make sure the eyes are tight. Because if it is bilateral, you will not be able to see the face symmetry. Somebody said, sir. Sir. So can you explain that gaze again in a more? Uh, I wish you had something to draw. Okay, yeah. So there is something called supranuclear gaze. In fact, all gaze is supranuclear, and then eye movements. So this is from the cortex, either the frontal or parieto occipital the frontal projects let me just this is not uh, writing at all so the right frontal pen hip you have nice hmm. I'm only going to show you from the supranuclear frontal eye field. Okay, so just in front of the motor cortex, you have this frontal eye field which projects to the opposite pons. So if you stimulate this, the right, this will move towards the left conjugately, horizontally. Okay, that is the frontal eye field. For vertical gaze, it's in the midbrain, periaqueductal. So if you have a problem here, conjugate movements upwards are difficult. So in patients who have connectors, they have vertical gaze palsy. That is different from a weakness. So if you have a gaze palsy, the eye movements can, you can do doll's eye movements, you ask him to fix it. And the eye movements will go up and down. So there is no weakness. But you can't do upward gaze by yourself when asked to do so. Because your gaze center is gone. Hydrocephalus also? Correct. The hydrocephalus because it presses upon this area. So connectors, hydrocephalus, other diseases, rare diseases like Neiman Pick, etc. can give rise to vertical gaze pulses. Horizontal gaze pulses, typically you get a stroke. What happens? Suppose you have a right MCA stroke. What happens immediately to the eyes? Suppose there is a right side stroke, you can't look to the left. Correct? So your eyes then turn to the right. So it's typically said, no? the eyes will look towards the lesion in an acute destructive lesion. But suppose the irritative lesion, it will go to the opposite side. Suppose the epilepsy over here, boom, your eyes will go to the opposite side. So these are conjugate supranuclear, above the nucleus, control of gaze. Okay. Any of you understood? And, um, so he's so really got no weakness. I thought you would find a little weakness on the Opposite side also, the facial nerve. But the eye closure is very strong on that side. Okay. Mm. Power. Upper limb power. Upper limb. Yeah, 
ऊपर कर ना यहाँ कर कर सही कह वो हाथ से कर नहीं दुखता है ठीक है मत कर मेकिंग लाइन जाओ इधर चल के चल के दिखाएगा चलता नहीं है खड़े होगा सो जाएगा कुछ नहीं करेंगे नहीं सुलाता हूँ कुछ नहीं करेंगे सोने का है क्या ठीक है सबके पास सुई है ही नहीं ना इधर सुई नहीं है पूछे के वही बताना है तुम बेटा इट्स नॉट इवर्टेड विच इज अ गुड साइन राइट सो इज नॉट सीवियरली हाइपोटॉनिक एनी वे ये पैर ये पंजा ऊपर कर पंजा पंजा ये ऊपर कर करना ऊपर नीचे कर जो से ये ऊपर कर ये ऊपर कर ऊपर कर ऐसे कर श्रीकांत ऊपर कर ना ऐसा हाँ ठीक है ही क्या ये ऊपर कर वेरी गुड आई थिंक दैट्स इन ऑफ नाउ What is I mean, एक मिनट कीप ए हैंड ऑन दैट कैसे है वॉट आर आई डेमोन्स्ट्रेटिंग दुखेगा तो बताना है ना दुख रहा है वॉट मेन इंजन विच मीन्स रूट इन्वॉल्वमेंट सो यू आर शोइंग दिस इज द ऑलमोस्ट हंड्रेड परसेंट साइन इन जीबीएस ये देख ठीक है ठीक है ओके सो दिस इज ऑलवेज देर दे इज अ कंडीशन फॉर पेनफुल जीबीएस वे देर इज नो वीकनेस इट्स ओनली मीन इट्स अ वेरियंट इट्स ओनली पेन एंड दे कैंट वॉक एन ऑल बिकॉज ऑफ द सीवियर पेन सो इट्स कॉल पेनफुल इट रिकवर्स वेरी नाइसली बट द पेन इज ऑफुल इन दैट Okay, and that's also true in any regular GBS either. Put care, bed. Put care, bed. No bed, brother. No bed, brother. You see, if you put it, then it will hurt. Either put it or not. I put it. Okay, I put it. Okay. Put. 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 नेक फ्लेक्स वीकनेस पेट पे सोएगा पेट पे सो जाओ ना क्या प्रॉब्लम है फिर ना तुम सुला दो उसको पेट पे सुलाता हूं अच्छा ठीक है ठीक है अच्छा सो जाए एनीथिंग एल्स जर्ट्स सर एबडोमिन सुपरफिशियल रिफ्लेक्सेस एबडोमिनल रिफ्लेक्स इज एबसेंट क्रिमास्टिकल फ्लेक्स कुड नॉट बी एलिसेटेड बिकॉज बायोलेट्रल स्कोटम वॉज एमटी एंड बायोलेट्रल टेस्ट कुड नॉट बी वर नॉट पैलपेबल और विजिबल देन प्लांटर वॉज बायोलेट्रल फ्लेक्स सो वॉट एक्सक्लूज जीबीएस ऑन एग्जामिनेशन प्रेजेंस ऑफ रिफ्लेक्सेस रॉन्ग First day, very often reflexes are present. Depending on the severity of GBS, we may, have, especially knee jerk, may not go. Ankle jerk usually does. So yes, you're right, 90, 95 percent of the times. But just because reflexes are present doesn't exclude GBS. Second, especially in the early stage. Second, asymmetry no, doesn't exclude sensory level. You have cold, hot, 
So how do you check sensation? Never use a pin as far as possible because they get very upset. ये ठंडा है गरम है ठंडा है गरम है बेटा ठंड ये क्या है ठंडा है गरम ठंड ये क्या है ना है गरम है हां और सा नहीं गरम है नहीं गरम है ठंडा है क्या अच्छा ये देख ये ठंडा है ज्यादा कि ये ठंडा है ज्यादा ऊपर ऊपर ज्यादा ठंडा है तो मेरे को बोल जब भी ठंडा इक्वल होगा यहां गरम है ना गरम है कि ठंडा है ये ठंडा है ये ठंडा है ऊपर के नीचे सो देर इज अ ग्लव एंड स्टॉकिंग वॉट यू आर टॉकिंग अबाउट एंड देर हैपन्स माइल्ड ग्लव एंड स्टॉकिंग इज वेरी कॉमन इन जीबीएस बट रिमेम्बर इट्स अ लेवल ऑन द ट्रंक रूज राउट पेट भी दुखता है अच्छा सो मे बी यू शुड डू अर प्रॉफिट आई एम शो आई एम जस्ट के डिंग ओके ठीक है एनीथिंग एल्स एग्जामिनेशन जस्ट कंफर्म वॉट वी थॉट जाओ घर जाओ अभी ओके नॉट टेल मी वेन डू यू यूज आई वी आई जी इन जीबीएस फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल बिफोर दैट वॉट इज द कॉस्ट ऑफ जीबीएस Or before that, those first two diagnoses. How do you differentiate? Patient comes to you. You've seen him on the first or second day. What do you think will help? NCV. So some changes might be seen, but they are most of the time seen later. Anything else? CSF changes. CSF changes are when. So you shouldn't do it. Or you should do it. Why? If we say, "Well, after the second week, do on the second week." No? Why are you doing the tests? No, no. Why are you doing the tests? You have clinically GBS. Why are you doing any tests? Give an idea, Ajay. So really speaking, we should ask ourselves why we are doing the test: to confirm the diagnosis or exclude other diagnoses. So the only diagnosis I think we should be, and the reason we want to exclude a diagnosis, if it is the enterovirus, your IVIG won't do anything, and you'll be down about twenty, thirty grand for nothing. Correct? So in that situation. How does the CSF help you? Ah, you get aseptic meningitis. Usually, many cells in GBS. You should never get more than 50 cells. Usually, you get no cells, but occasionally some cells may be there, but never more than 50. So, if you have a lot of cells, maybe it's not GBS. Or is GBS associated with? No. HIV, very correct. HIV, not important in pediatrics. In older patients, you have GBS. Remember, peripheral nerve immune disorders are common in HIV, especially in the older patients. If you have a 10, 15 year old, you might want to keep that in mind. So the CSF is done to exclude other disorders. Okay. If uh, you still get both of them normal. And they still want to be sure. Then you do the MRI spine with contrast, and there the anterior roots are enhancing. In enterovirus, usually anterior and posterior roots are enhancing, but we are not doing it to, to, to uh, for enterovirus. We are doing it for GBS. So when do you use IVIG? Every GBS, not every GBS. Yeah, but you could. I want to do EMG nerve. Okay, so you do EMG nerve conduction in the first week. It's normal, or it's showing absent F waves. Doesn't help you then that much in differentiating the two. 
Because even in anterior horn cell disease very often, the uh, F waves which are, we may go away, but of course nerve conditions are usually done and if you get a positive finding of uh, uh, GBS, then obviously it's good for you. Is it painful? Is it indicated? No, 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 it's indicated. It's not a problem. Okay, now, so when do you give IVIG? 100%. And when may you not give IVIG? So rapidly progressive. Yes, rapidly progressive. Anything where you have a uh, person stopped walking, you have to give. Person on the ventilator, you have to give. A person who's got bulbar involvement, have to give. So those kind of kids, you have to give. Uh, if uh, which is the one you mean weight? So the walking ones. Okay, the data on IVIG, plasma exchange, etc. is on those who are non-ambulatory. There is no data, not much data at least, on ambulatory patients whether you really improve the prognosis. You understand that many patients are walking around, they have a little bit of foot drop, pain, they are otherwise fine. Do you need to give IVIG or not? So, my tendency is to give it if you can afford it. Because I don't think, you know, you don't want that you did not give it and then there was some deficit which remained there later. But otherwise, generally, especially in public hospitals, avoid it if you can't afford it. If it's something rapidly progressive, what do you think of? Say you have the problem in the morning, you could walk and by evening is on the ventilator. Exonal. Exonal. So AB, Aman. The ones who are more slow are the demyelinating ones. And remember one thing, the demyelinating ones and the Aman are equal in India, China, other places. In the West, main, there is mainly demyelination. And these Aman, one more thing is they come in epidemics. So that's another important thing. These come in epidemics probably because of Campylobacter association. Anything else you want to discuss? You all have any questions? Sir, in this patient, the recovery is asymmetrical. One side is improved more as compared to the other. Is it um, known to happen? No, there are some asymmetries and all that, but that doesn't rule the diagnosis out. So, like I told you, there are three, four things. Persistent bladder, very asymmetrical. So, you have only one leg involved. All of you know the other variants of GBS, right? How do other things present? Sometimes they present as a descending, what is called the pharyngo-cervico-brachial variant. So everything is in the, we had one patient, upper limbs, um, bulb, so they had problems in swallowing, but she was walking around. And then she went into a uh, descending thing, and she also was very asymmetric, very asymmetric. If we were doubting whether she had GBS, but it finally turned out to be that. Then there are other Miller Fisher, of course, all of you know. So Miller Fisher generally doesn't require. You know, everybody knows Miller Fisher. You know Miller Fisher? Huh? Correct. So, ophthalmoplegia, reflexia, and all. Now, there is an overlap syndrome, which many of you all may not be really aware. So, you have MFS, Miller Fisher syndrome, GBS overlap. And you may have something which starts off as ophthalmoplegia and you may go into a full-blown GBS. And which antibodies, you know, the antibodies with these, these certain antibodies which are associated with certain types of GBS. These antibodies are called anti-gangliocyte antibodies. So which one is this? GQ1. GQ1B is all this Miller-Fisher overlap syndromes, etc. And Aman is GD1A. So there are different antibodies. Important, forget about the name of the antibody. With regular GBS, there is no consistent antibody. 
And Aman and Miller Fisher does have some, not always, but sometimes. What is the, suppose this patient, let me give you a scenario. You gave this kid, he's better now, and say three weeks into the illness, he again goes. It's a recurrence? No, it's not. It's treatment, I mean, it's fluctuations during one attack of GBS. And I think that can occur up to two months, right? Up to two months. So you may get up and down, you know, the same attack. That's not necessarily a recurrence. If it occurs after two months, then you worry about CID, CID. CID. chronic inflammatory. So chronic inflammatory can come for like a persistent GBS, it can come acutely, or it can come like a chronic, you know, relapsing, remitting kind of thing. Biggest difference is response to steroids. GBS, they also response to steroids, but IV, IG should be given first with steroids next. When do you use steroids in GBS? Always pain. Pain. When the pain, root pains are terrible, short course of oral steroids, they do very well. But usually IVA they should be given because there was data in the past that only steroids you might not improve as compared to IVIG plus steroids or IVIG alone. Sir, sir, uh, sir, how to calculate a developmental quotient? No, for example, a one-year-old, I mean, you know, we used to be, didn't, we were never taught this. We were taught sitting age, grasping age, uh, prone age, and that's what I use. So I'll just tell you what I do. So suppose you make a child sit, and he's a one-year-old, and he's sitting like a five-month-old, with his forward, anterior support. That to me, his sitting age is five months. Development quotient 5 upon 12 by 100. That's how you calculate. So you calculate in different spheres, and then you see okay, if he is more or less equal in all, maybe slightly worse in language. So you have a 3 year old, he is just standing with support, he is just saying tata and bye bye, he is using his hands, pincer grasp, not speaking as yet but he's responding to his mama or to his name. So if you say his fine motor pincer about nine months, ten months, standing with support nine months, ten months. Stranger, I mean uh, socially he's saying bye bye you know, nine months, ten months. But <coughs> language wise he's a little lower. That is a patient who's got global developmental delay more in language and is probably going to become a child with mental retardation. Okay. These are very simple, huh? they don't always apply. Then if you have a child whose gross motor is three months, say he is one year old, he's not even holding his head. But he's using his hands very nicely, he's got the pincer. He is very strangely anxious. He's speaking several maybe he doesn't speak as yet, but he knows different things in the house fan and light. What do you think he's got? Ah, my God. <coughs> what do you think? SMS. Neuromuscular. Absolutely. Or rarely it could be cerebral palsy. You know, spastic diplegics, but they are not so bad. Three months is too bad. But they may be six months, seven months and, you know, normal mentally. But usually neuromuscular. Then suppose you have a third day. You have a child who is at one year, standing with support, walks at 18 months. Say at 18 months. He's walking at 18 months, just started. He's not saying bye bye. He's not talking. He's not having attachment to them. That is autism. So social and language maximally affected. Autism. Autism, fine motor and motor also affect him very little. So the pattern of 
involvement is very important. Thank you so much for that uh, lovely clinic, sir. Uh, apologies for the technical problems, but the entire webcast can be seen. It will be see, uh, it will be uploaded by tonight. So from tomorrow, you can see the uh, hour that we missed. Uh, next week, being the DNB exams, there will be no broadcast. And uh, the next broadcast will be on the 2nd of December from Chennai, Kanchi Kamakoti Child's Trust Hospital at 2.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us.